Father in heaven, as we're about to open and enter your word right now, I pray that you take full possession of myself and let your people hear no one else but the one who spake like no other man. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In the book of Matthew chapter 5, as we begin that chapter, it has been called the Sermon on the Mount. And it is one of the, you know, one of the many teachings that Jesus ever gave. But you know, it is a Sermon on the Mount that theologians and scholars and historians who have studied his teaching and they have looked at that and they have said, you know what? The, the theology, the power, the ethos that come from the Sermon on the Mount outshines all other speakers. By the way, do you know that Jesus was just about in his 30s when he was declaring these things? In his 30s. He had never been speaking before. He just been baptized in chapter 3 and chapter 4. He's gone into the, you know, into the wilderness. He's been tempted by the devil. And boom, he shows up. And boom, here we have the Sermon on the Mount. Now, what is it? Why did, why did Jesus deliver this sermon? Let's just go back in history a little bit. You see, he was speaking to the Jewish nation. We looked at this this morning. And you see, the Jewish nation, or the descendants of Jacob, they were promised to be the chosen people of God. And to them was, was entrusted the oracles of God, the promises of the coming Messiah, the promises of a great nation that was to come, if they were to obey. Now we know the story that in the Old Testament, you have again and again the children of Israel, they fall away from the ideal that God had given them. And you remember when Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments and the law of God. And when he came down and he spoke these laws to the people, do you remember what they said? All that the Lord has said, we will what? We will do. This is in Exodus. We haven't even gone to Numbers yet. But you already see that very soon after that, they fall. There is always a rising and a falling. There is always, you know, cliffs and, 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 and valleys. They fall. They're up and downs, ups and downs. And, and God keeps sending messages again and again, warning them that, you see, you are my people. I love you so much. But a time will come. I will have to just let you go. I will have to let you go. And we know that David did a powerful thing because before David, they were not a united people. They were tribes from all over the place. You go up to Naphtali, Zebulun, all the way down, different, different tribes. And David shows up and he brings these different tribes together under one roof, one nation, one king, King David, and one capital city, Jerusalem. And he leaves as he bows down and leaves. We have Solomon. Solomon was a gifted leader. God gave him the gift of wisdom. But something happens during the time of Solomon. The scripture tells us that he went and he got himself entangled with many wives. Many, many wives. And they took away his commitment to God. And God said to Solomon, I will do it. I will divide the kingdom into two. But I will not do it during your lifetime. Because he had repented. But I will do it after you. Because of my servant David. And the story goes on that yes. The kingdom of, you know, of, uh, of Israel was divided. You have the northern Israel kingdom. You have the southern Judah. That was composed of the descendants of Judah. A few Levites. Because they were the temple was in Jerusalem at the time. And a few descendants of Benjamin. That formed the southern tribe of Judah. By the way, that's where we get the name Jew from. And the northern kingdom, they were later scattered and the Assyrians came and took them off and finally brought in the Samaritans who mixed blood with, you know, some of the Jews uh, of old. And finally the, the, the southerners rejected the, you know, the Samaritans and they said, you know what? We want nothing to do with you people. Now you must remember this. That when the northern kingdom was taken, 
I think it was just before the time of Hezekiah or during the time of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah has just three generations after from which Israel or Judah will also be taken exiled. Not captives, but exiled this time. The northern was scattered, never to be reunited again. But the southern, the southern kingdom was to be taken um, exiled in Babylon. Now, here was the problem. The reason why you read the book of Jeremiah, why the southern was also finally taken, is because they had walked away from the ideals and the laws that God had given them. That was the promise. If you abide, I will keep you. If you reject me, I will let you go. Finally, a time came when mercy could no longer plead. And finally, the southern kingdom would be taken to Babylon. It was the rejection. It was the open rebellion of, and, 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 and the rejection of God that led them away captives. So when in Babylon, when in Babylon, something began to happen, there was no temple. That's where the idea of building synagogues came from. They needed a place they could worship. But God had said you could only worship, you can only sacrifice, you know, at the temple in Jerusalem. But they didn't have one. And so while in exile, they started to yearn for the knowledge of God. It is during the time of exile, by the way, that the Bible was written down. I'm talking after the book of Moses. That's when now the people of God, they, they longed to have God in their midst. And they got the scribes and they started to write the stories before this. These were oral told stories. They would just tell them orally. But soon after the exile, you have what is called the Old Testament. It was now coded, it was in a book form, and God's people had a word. There was another development while they were in Babylon. This is what they said. Look, the reason why God has rejected us and why we have been taken away exile is because we have walked away from God. Now, this is what we're going to do. We want to keep the law so that this does not happen again. And there began the, uh, you know, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, people who can go and teach the law. And now you have another aspect because before they rejected God. Now they're saying, look, we will be saved if we keep the law. All that the Lord has said we want to do. Now, scholars say they had the Old Testament and then they had the commentary to the Old Testament. Mm. The commentary, the task of the commentary was to explain to the people what the Bible meant. Mm. And then they had another commentary on the commentary mm. and another one on the commentary. Can you see what's happening? Mm. You know? You see, the problem is now they are trusting in the human power to keep the law. And so every new theologian that comes says, you know what, this passage means something different. And so they add commentary and commentary and commentary to the extent that when Jesus appears, they are forgotten. In fact, it's the wise men who come and say, you know what, we have come to worship the king. And Herod says to the leaders, he says, do you know anything about the king of the Jews? Mm. Oh, yes. yes. That's interesting. Mm. They knew where Jesus would be born. Yes. How is it that they didn't know? How is it that they forgot? And you see, the reason why they, you know, the, the, the reason why they said what they said while they were in exile, they said, you see, we have been in exile because we have rejected God. We want to keep the word of God. We want to keep the law so that we are not rejected. They kept the law so much that they forgot even the time when Jesus appeared. When Jesus appeared. And so you have two systems. The old that rejected and that took them nowhere. The new that kept the law live by the law, tradition, do it again and again. Even that could not help. And there is only one thing that you can see here. 
Number one, if we walk away from God, we are doomed. If we try to keep the law, we are doomed. There is one other aspect that we see. And the final one is called, and we see this today, it's called existentialism. Existentialism is a belief that you only have today, so do what you can do, enjoy yourself. After all, tomorrow you may die. I think some of you remember a couple of years ago, on banners across many buses during the time of Christmas, you saw those words, probably God is dead, so enjoy your life. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it was all over the place. And so you have Jesus coming in, in between two, you know, great systems. You have the, you have the traditionalists, those who believe in keeping the law, and you have those who have rejected and even killed the prophets of God. And here comes Jesus, who everybody has been waiting. By the way, when you read the lesson, it actually says they believed that they were living at the time of the end. Something was about to happen. Everybody was anticipating a coming of a Messiah, a king, someone sent from God, who is going to do the work of David, but in a much greater manifestation. They were all waiting. And John comes, and he decries the ways of the Pharisees, the elders, and the teachers of the law. He says, repent. You see, friends, because by our works, we shall be condemned. We by our work. Their works brought them no nearer to God, so as well as the rejection of God. Never can human works bring us closer to God. Because Isaiah says, our works and our righteousness is as what? As filthy rags. Is as, as filthy rags. And so Jesus comes. And he brings the multitudes together. And it's always fascinating. You know, when you read, it says, multitudes followed him. And I'm thinking, you know, just think about, I don't know, some of you haven't been to, you know, Israel. But I'm thinking of, of him walking, in, you know, around the Lake of Galilee. And thousands of people following him. And I'm asking myself a question, why? But when you read the account, you find there were two things that went with Jesus. Actually, three. <coughs> I think we could say four, because some have called it the four square gospel. <coughs> he went from synagogue to synagogue. That's the first thing he did. And he taught his people. So he went, that's one. He taught, that's two. He preached, that's three. You know something else? He says, and they brought him all people with all kinds of illnesses and sicknesses and he healed them all. Amen. That's fascinating. Amen. One man, 30 years old, mm -hmm. healing all kinds of diseases. And you know, it's not just what he spoke. His life was exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. In other words, you could not fault Jesus. Whatever he said, that's what you got in his life. Mm -hmm. And his word was backed up by his actions. If God was with him, no wonder he could heal. Mm. That's right. Mm. Have you heard what the demons said when they saw him? Have you come to torment us? Mm. The demons knew who he was. Mm. How fascinating. The demons knew, but the Pharisees mm. rejected him. Mm. And I, I listened to that all over again and again. And in fact, as, you, as you're about to end... You know, chapter 4. This is what he said. And Jesus went about all Galilee. Verse 23. Teaching in their synagogues. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And healing all kinds of sickness. And all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all sick people. Who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And you know, some translation, I think the New International Translation says, and they brought in people who were suffering from uh, long-term pain. You know, 
I was just uh, speaking to someone who was saying, you know, Pastor, I went to the hospital and they have tried to look and find the cause of my problem and my illness. They could not find. They know I was ill. The systems were saying something is wrong. But with all the technology, even they could not find. But Jesus, this is 2,000 plus years ago. You bring all sorts of sicknesses and diseases and he heals them all. No wonder thousands followed him. And he goes up to the mountainside and he begins the Sermon on the Mount. And it begins by these words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you know, as he's sitting around and looking in front of him, in the, in the congregation, in the multitudes, you have those who believed in the law. Those who trusted that they were righteous, that they had it all together, that they did not need a savior. Their works was enough. That was what? You know, amongst them, amongst them. But there were also tired folks, peasants, farmers, tax collectors, publicans, prostitutes, all sorts of people. Something about Jesus that drew them to him. And as he speaks, obviously, because everybody's anticipating a new King David to appear. The Pharisees and, uh, you know, the teachers of the law, they are pressing themselves close. You know, we will be, after all, we have been the teachers of the law. We will be next in line. We will be next to the king. And Jesus looks at them, but his gaze passes them by. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. This is the kingdom of heaven. You know, the Greek word for blessed is more than just blessed. If you look at it in your own vernacular, if, you, if, you, if you've got a second language that's not English, you will find that it's not just being blessed. It means a state of happiness. Mm -hmm. It means a state of happiness. And this state of happiness is a long term. It's not, it's not that comes in waves, you know. We, we are happy because of something and then it goes. No, he seems to be saying that those who ever feel a need for, save, for a savior are in a state of happiness. Continuous happiness. Amen. And you know why? He says the kingdom of heaven is theirs. In other words... God has a kingdom. Mm 